in my childhood, uh, I was one of those kids who was crazy about math and science uh, and playing chess, of course. Uh, and when I was 12, my chess trainer uh, sent me to Internet Club because I, I had no computer at home, no internet connection. Uh, so, he so he sent me to Internet Club to practice there. And in Azerbaijan, Internet Clubs were the places where the boys mostly were coming up together and uh, playing computer games and calling each other programmers and hackers. Uh, so. Um, I really do remember their facial expression when I first entered that uh, internet club uh, and I didn't know the word programmer or hacker back then. So between the games, I just started to search for these terms. And I do remember that uh, I found lots of the pictures of men in, in front of computers, in front of big servers, playing with the cables, uh, coding, hacking. And uh, I hadn't undoubtable believe that, okay, computers are for men and programmers are men. Uh, but it was something disturbing there because not only people around, but uh, the computer I was using to practice chess games uh, was thinking that programmers are for are men and computers are for men only. 15 years passed since then, and I think that my love towards technology was um, stronger than all of those stereotypes around. And I did my um, degrees in applied math and computer science. Now I'm doing my PhD in computer science and working in one of the most promising scientific institutions in Europe. And throughout all of these years, I was trying to um, bring more women in tech and I was managing lots of social projects to inspire women in tech and to educate more children in STEM fields. But even today, after 15 years, when I'm searching for engineer, computer engineer or programmer in internet, I see lots of pictures like this. And it's, this separation is not only tech related, and you can try it uh, by yourself. If you will just take your smartphone and search for, uh, try to, to translate a sentence, uh, like somebody is a doctor and somebody is a nurse from just a gender neutral language, for example, my language, Azerbaijani, to English language, without pointing out the gender of the person, you will see, you will get this result. Like he is a doctor, she is a nurse. And the same with a pilot and flight attendant, programmer and housekeeper. You might now think that, okay, like Google Translate is doing the separation. How is that important? Is it, does it have something to do with me, with my future, with the future of my kids? So at this point, I want you just to imagine that just because of you are a female, you are getting the advertisements of less paid jobs in internet. Or because of your, uh, your postal code, your credit score will be lower from the ones who are living in more centrally located zones. Or because of your skin color, you will be recognized as a, predict uh, as a uh, possible treat in predictive policing. In 2015, Google Maps recognized two Afro-Americans as gorillas. Yes, in 21st century, when we are aiming to explore new galaxies, we are still fighting against gender and racial discrimination. But why AI is so discriminative? Couldn't we just build more transparent, fair, unbiased algorithms? The answer is that AI is discriminative because we humans are discriminative and we are mapping all of our human biases into the systems we build, algorithms we develop, data we use to train all of those systems. Currently, I'm doing an interdisciplinary research on gender and racial biases in AI. And in the center of my investigations, of course, is the data, because artificial intelligence in the heart of artificial intelligence are mostly machine learning and deep learning algorithms. And by machine learning, we mean a technique which enables systems, mediums to operate 
not exactly and explicitly in the way that we program them, but also to learn through, through, uh, through their own experiences. And by experience, we again mean data. So that's critically important, which kind of data we use to train all of those systems, how we design and develop our models and algorithms to work with this data, and which kind of data is coming after to teach all of those systems. And here we come to another buzzword, which is widely, uh, widely used today, uh, big data. And the problem with big data today is that the quantity of data does not always ensure the quality of data. Big data does not always mean good data. Just a little example what happened this year in Amazon. They developed an AI uh, recruitment tool which was doing a pre-screening of applications. And just in several hours, it taught itself to eliminate female candidates. And after several uh, investigations, they found out that the reason behind it is that the system was trained with a data that was 10 years old and which was mostly collected by men. So here we understand that we have to really be critical about um, how the data was collected, by whom it was collected, and for which purposes it was collected. Maybe it's containing some historical or ideological mappings, because that's for sure that the data that was collected 50 or 100 years ago was not capturing minorities or even women. So think about the critical consequences of decisions made by those systems which were trained by, uh, with all of those data. And I have a bad news for people who has darker skin color um, because most of the facial recognition systems are unable to detect your face. And this is not my investigations. This is um, amazing research done by MIT, which is called Gender Shades. And uh, they were investigating on most popular facial recognition systems. And it came out that the darker the skin color of the person, more sensitive systems become to detect that. And here we really understand how important is the uh, diversity of the teams who are developing all of those systems. Just imagine how it would be interesting if the period tracking ap application would be designed only by white men. I don't have nothing to do with white men, of course, but um, I'm just, I, I am trying to emphasize here how is it important um, to be able to detect biases in the systems and to understand the wide, diverse user groups who will be, who will be using your system. And I was talking about Google uh, Translate example. I will not go more into technical details, but imagine the words as, as a vectors. And the reason behind all of those biases were that uh, most of the words like homemaker, receptionist, nurse, uh, were mapped to the vector close to she, and the words like boss, maestro, philosopher to he. So with this information in your mind, I just want to ask you, think about this candidate we have here. We only have information his, uh, about his um, background, his name, surname, and we have some kind of a score uh, which enables us to give um, predictions about his position, like engineer or uh, designer. So what do you think? What will happen if we will just simply change the name from a male name to a female name. What will happen to the ranking score for engineer, let's say? Decrease, exactly. So the ranking score for engineer will decrease and the ranking score for designer will increase. Just to point out to the importance of the value we generate in digital world. Unfortunately, most of the people um, are using AI chatbots to train them some offensive language. And these AI chatbots on Twitter are then using 
that offensive language to operate with other users. And before the, and it's a real study that before the Brexit vote, 43,000 AI uh, Brexit uh, posts were uh, posted by AI chatbots. And here we really see that how it's important how we act in digital world and how it comes back to us as a political manipulation, let's say. Why I was giving all of these examples? Um, because AI is really mirroring all of the biases we have in society. Uh, just imagine that you have a kid and you are raising this kid, which is learning 100 times faster than a real human, and even maybe faster. And it's really learning from all interactions, from all communications, uh, everything that's going on around. And you should not be surprised if at the end of the day, this kid is turning up, telling that you are, uh, you have a different ethnicity and this country is not for you to live in or you are a female and your place is in the kitchen, or your skin is a bit darker and you are 25% more likely to be a terrorist. You should not be surprised at all because you raise your kid in this way with this kind of mindset. And if your kid does not have a diverse and inclusive view of the world, most probably you and the society does not have this view as well. And with all of these biases, now I really understand why I was so unexpected 15 years ago in that internet club and how today and 15 years ago, it was captured in digital world by exclusion of women in technology. What I'm doing today, I'm trying to um, investigate on racial and gender biases in AI from interdisciplinary perspective. And the main vision I have here is to come up with the strategies to address them in political and economical level. And the main goal of my research is to raise awareness of the citizens and public about capabilities and limitations of artificial intelligence. And I'm sure that all over the world, and as well as in Europe, we are currently located here, there are lots of events going on and doesn't matter which, from which faculty are you, which background you have, I really do encourage you to participate in public engagement events, in exhibitions and really understand what's going on in this field because it is really impacting our today and it will impact our tomorrow and the future of our kids. And even if there is a, still a long way to go, I hope that together we can build more inclusive, diverse and fair digital society. Thank you very much. <laughs>